Hello and welcome to Deal Flow, the show that connects into the world of mergers and acquisitions and puts the spotlight on the deals making headlines. I'm Erica van der Marwe. The South African Competition Commission is a notable gatekeeper in the sphere of deal making in this market. In tonight's show, we discuss the mandate, scope, and decision making processes of the Competition Commission. Before we get into that, a quick look at our deals of the week. Italy's Ferrero, the maker of Nutella chocolate spread, has denied it received an offer from Swiss food group Nestle or any other competitor and said it was not for sale. Chinese personal computer maker Lenovo has signed a non-disclosure agreement to examine the books of troubled Canadian smartphone maker BlackBerry. Motorola Solutions is exploring the sale of its underperforming wireless LAN business, which has grappled with a declining share in a market dominated by rivals such as Cisco Systems. Locally, Pan African Resources and Canada's Guiani Gold have bid jointly for Anglo Gold Ashanti's Navachub mine in Namibia for 131 million US dollars. Anglo Gold put the Navachub mine up for sale earlier this year as part of cost cutting measures. And lastly, Congo's government has issued state mining firm Jekamins a stern warning against a reported proposed sale of the firm's 20% stake in Kamoto Copper without its approval. The South African Competition Commission has the power to veto small and intermediate mergers and makes recommendations on larger mergers to the Competition Tribunal. This week we look at the role of this regulator and the role it plays in M&A transactions. Trudy Makaya is the Deputy Commissioner at the Competition Commission. Welcome Trudy, really good to have you here. Thank you. So Trudy, the, it just seems as though the Competition Commission has a rather powerful and essential gatekeeping role in the South African market and I'm sure this applies to similar, similar regulatory bodies in other jurisdictions. How would you describe your mandate and the, the scope of your powers? Our mandate is essentially to look after competition. And we do this from um, many perspectives. I mean, the basic principle behind the legislation is that we want to have a vibrant, competitive market economy. And so the ways that, as a watchdog, we have to regulate the economy to ensure um, that market power where it exists is not exploited to harm consumers, and also that there's um, proper entry or easy entry um, of uh, businesses into the market to the extent that we're able to facilitate that. So we look at different areas. So in terms of our enforcement uh, mandate, uh, when it comes to what we call prohibited practices, that's where we would be um, investigating cartels. That's where we'd be investigating abuse of dominance. So that's more um, looking at behavior in a market that's already occurred and saying, is this anti-competitive? Does it um, go against competition law? Yes. Then we also have mergers where it's more forward looking. Because I suppose if you're trying to protect competition in a market, you know, one way that it can be undermined could be via a cartel, but the other way could be those same cartel is saying, why bother with a cartel, let's actually merge. So then we have to look at mergers and say, are some of, some of these mergers going to create market power that is going to be exploited? So that's the basic question we ask ourselves. Is this merger going to lead to a substantial lessening of competition? Right. And as a secondary or a second test, not secondary, a second test, is this merger in the public interest? Right. So those are the kind of uh, broad mandate with regards to this. So interwoven in all of that, and this is also clear on your website uh, as your objective, it is to promote equity and fairness in the economy. My understanding though is that those aren't necessarily sort of absolute concepts that what one, it depends on what side of the ruling you might be. And going back to your example of cartels, I mean, some, some might argue that you need some large dominant players to, particularly at the early stage of certain industries, to make sure that it exists and that there indeed is a vibrancy. Yeah, so in both instances, we're not against dominance in of itself. So in terms of enforcement, it's only when dominance is being abused. Um, and the Act states quite clearly when it's being abused, either you know, excessive pricing, exclusionary behavior, inducement, all those unfair behaviors that push um, other competitors out to the detriment of consumers. In terms of mergers, once again, it's not just that the firm will be dominant, therefore it's bad, or that there'll be high market shares, therefore it's bad. We have to do an assessment and say it'll have high market shares, but will it be able to exercise um, this market power to the detriment of consumers? Yes. So for instance, you might have a merger that you know, creates a dominant player, 
but um, customers are very powerful. They've got negotiating power. They have the credible threat of entry into that market themselves, yes. and then we wouldn't be concerned. So it's not just about dominance in itself, because dominance, yes, can be good for scale economies. Right. It's more, is this dominance yes. likely to be exploited? Right. So we have examples of, of both of these within the telecoms industry right now. We've got, on, on the first side, of the, the issue of, of, of large, powerful players in um, Celsi accusing MTN and Vodacom of anti-competitive behavior. And, and I think this is an ongoing theme. And on the other side of, of uh, potential m and transactions, uh, Vodacom having a look at Neotel. Um, on both of those sides, what are the developments that you've seen and, and what are the issues in your mind? Yeah, I mean, for both of those um, developments, it's still early days. So for the abuse of dominance claim, I think it is a theme that emerges in many other markets, but that we would have to evaluate within our market because it's about a small entrant trying to capture market share from incumbents and um, the way the incumbents price um, capturing customers. Now, is that capturing customers simply good business strategy that's engendering loyalty and that's fine, or is it done in an anti-competitive manner um, that would make sure that any entrant can't compete and also any efficient entrant can compete. So that's the test that we would have to undertake um, in this instance. Of course, first we'd have to establish that the players are dominant separately. We, we don't have joint dominance in our act. So each of them are dominant and also have to prove that each of them are abusing their dominance in, in um, the voice um, right. mobile market. In terms of tra the, 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 the potential merger, once again, we would have to see, is that com a combination going to be detrimental to consumers? So for instance, is it likely that prices are going to be up either in the business segment or for um, end consumers? Um, that's an assessment we'd have to take. And we would talk to industry players. We would look at the pricing trends in the market. We'd look at what is the source of market power really in this industry. And then we'd have to take a view. And you know, it could be either way. It could be that this player becomes a more effective competitor to existing right. to other players, and it's pro-competitive, or that they become super dominant. Customers don't have choice. Yes and it's prohibited. Not so too long ago, you vetoed a deal in a completely different industry, in the publishing industry between Juta and Van Skyk. What, what, I would imagine those are relatively small players, but you probably felt that together they'd be big in the industry. Yes. You see, I think this is an issue with retail. When we look at those markets, it's usually about a specific area. So in those cases, we looked at literally campuses across the country that were going to be affected by this transaction. And I think even anecdotally, as some you know people who've been at tertiary institutions, you know it's, it's due to on sky. <laughs> so the two of them merging in many campuses where we did a, you know, a, a campus by campus analysis, it was clear that they were going to have significant market power and that they would definitely uh, be, be in a position to raise prices and that this would be a very uncompetitive mm -hmm. market structure. And we, in, we did interviews, did some surveys um, to establish how customers think about the market. So for instance, we did consider whether online sales um, could constrain any market power. And we find that at this stage in our market, online sales are not that viable. There's issues with postal service, etc. So that those are really the only yeah. main competitors and it couldn't go through. Trudy, going back to your processes, and, and this is available on your website, the, the area uh, where you do get involved, if there's a uh, potential M&A deal, and if the combined value of the transaction or the entity would be 560 million rand, that would be the trigger point for your entry. But it's only up to a certain window, up to 6.6 .6 billion rand. Beyond that, that's not your terrain, and there I understand you make recommendations to the competition tribunal. Yes, so it would be you know, an investigation, once again, using economic and legal tools to assess if there's market power. But when it is a large merger, it would then be a recommendation. And, you know, it's kind of predictable. Usually if it's an approval, it would go through um, easily. There'd be a short hearing. Of course, there might be other interveners in the market within the recommendation is wrong. But usually approvals are straightforward. Of course, if it's prohibited or if it's got conditions, a recommendation, then the other party might also want to make representations to the tribunal as to why this, that shouldn't be so, or if the condition is, if in their perspective should be different or not there at all, if the merger should go ahead. So there's a, um, a, a contestation there. Right. Trudy, do you stick to your timelines? Are you an entity that perhaps holds up the flow of deal making in South Africa? No, I think from our annual reports, um, most of our um, timelines are met. 
Uh, we've got statutory timelines in terms of when we, you know, the different types of sizes of mergers, the number of days we have to look at. And when we go past those number of days, we have to ask for an extension from the parties. And at any stage, the parties can challenge and say, well, you don't need more information, you don't need more time. So it's not as if we would just, um, we, we don't have the discretion mm -hmm. um, to just kind of um, continually keep an investigation open. Now, talking of discretion, and the DTI has recently recommended that the Competition Commission should have far more powers. And there are various aspects to that. One of that, them, for instance, would, would uh, require you to investigate strategic markets on a regular basis. So I, I would imagine it would be like telecoms or banking or, or retail, etc. Uh, what's your, your opinion on these recommendations and are they likely to be implemented? Um, they're wide ranging. So some of them um, have to have institutional mechanisms built around them. Others are quite um, straightforward and speak to already amendments that are already in place. So, you know, um, in April this year, we had an amendment to our act that allows us to conduct market inquiries. So DTI has latched onto that to say we should do a market inquiry every year or so. And I think that institutionally we can accommodate. We're about to um, get going to the healthcare market inquiry um, in, a f in coming months. So, um, you know, there's preparation that still has to be done, but I think that's something that could easily, that, that falls within the logic, really, of our analysis. The issues around price regulation that have been flagged by the DTI, I think there, that's what we really need to think about. You know, which markets are we talking about? Is it issues around steel? What do we do? What's the best way forward? But that's still all under discussion. Trudy, you've got a fantastic vantage point where you sit in terms of seeing what deals are, are occurring in South Africa. How would you describe the, the level of energy and activity as far as deal making, potential M&A transactions are concerned? I think from where we're sitting, it's not we're not at the highs in terms of just number of transactions of like the mid 2000s, but it, there is activity picking up. Um, we're seeing a lot of measures that are not problematic, so I think a lot of thought goes into um, putting together deals that are not going to be um, anti-competitive. Um, there's a lot in kind of our industrial sectors. Um, retail is also a big one. I think there's a bit of an issue there with people trying to get into markets um, and sometimes about the mass market having to issue? buy into leases, having to buy into licenses. Yes. You know, yes. I think there's um, issues. You know, that regulatory issues that kind of direct uh, business strategy towards certain transactions. But it, they, I mean, in the environment looks quite healthy. There's a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but there has been some foreign um, investment coming into the country. We see, you know, it's those deals. So I would say it's it's not back to the good old times, but there's, there's Warming activity. Warming up, certainly. Yeah. And in closing, Trudy, uh, what, what's, what sort of activity, cross-border activity are we seeing from South Africans moving across the borders? You mentioned foreigners, but in particular, um, industries from other African countries moving into South Africa. We don't see um, as much um, of that as foreigners still coming into South Africa. We also see some of our development finance institutions like the IDC getting involved in with um, transactions with um, international players. Uh, we've had also some um, investors coming into media, um, the Sekunjalo deal. Um, so, but I think in terms of going into the rest of Africa, I suppose that those authorities would also be seeing that activity, not necessarily us if it doesn't um, implicate this market. Trudy, thank you. Really good talking to you. That's Trudy Makaya. She's Deputy Commissioner at the Competition Commission. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of Deal Flow. Make sure to tune in same time next week. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Erika Fanamarva.